Hallelujah. All right, I want you to turn your Bibles to Job, the book of Job. That's where our foundational text will come from, the book of Job. And we're going to be reading chapter 23 and verse 12. And sometimes I will go back and forth uh, between the authorized King James Version, which is a real Bible, no, as well as the King James Version. Okay, so everybody got a Bible? So the book of Job. And let me get there because I'm in Psalm. So Job chapter 23, verse 12. Are we all there? Yes. Do I need to wait? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to wait because I want everybody to focus on the word because it's so important because based on the title of the message this evening, uh, I want everybody to be looking at the word, the word of God. All right. If you need more help, look at your table of contents and it'll help you out. And so we're going to move on. All right. Let's read together in unison. It says what? Neither have I gone back for the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. He, the word of God is saying here, I have, he says, I, Job says, I have esteemed the word of God. I have value. I have put above everything else the word of God more than my necessary food, more than my daily food that I need for, to, to provide for sustenance to keep me alive. He says that I desire God's word more than my necessary food. That is something that we need to capitalize and have in our own hearts. That we should desire God's word more than anything else. And especially in these last days and the days that we're living in and the things that uh, are going on. You need the word of God richly in your life. You know, I'm just looking at the number of people that are here tonight at Bible study. And I know there are people that are working, but there are a lot of them more are not working than are working. And I'm just thinking about the people. Uh, I, I'm on this, uh, this list with uh, prisoners, profile of prisoners, and a lot of them are from China. And how, you know, they have these house, these house churches because they have government churches, but you know, the government churches, you are limited what you can say. You can't mention the name of Jesus. You can't, you know, talk about the Bible. It, it, oh yeah, that's the way it's set up. But, you know, people who have become born again and who know Jesus and know the gospel, know the good news, because that's what the gospel is. The gospel is the good news. And they have got a hold of the good news. And in spite of all that they have to go through, they hold those churches, those house churches. And many of those people, those prisoners uh, that I'm praying for uh, that have been incarcerated and, you know, they come up with some trumped up charges, you know, uh, uh, they were uh, saying something against the, the government. You know, can you imagine how we are here in America, how much we say about things? We have such a freedom to speak here. But they, you know, they, if they say something contrary to what the government says, they can be put in prison. And so this, it was a whole group that were put in prison. They have been in prison like five, six, and seven years. And then there are certain areas in China where the, uh, there's a, 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 a particular place where, the, you know, one prison is worse than the other and where it's a camp like and they, you know, they're working out there in the hot and don't have water. But they, these are what they're doing to these Christians. But guess what? These Christians, and sometimes that's why I get, you know, kind of lipstick with Americans. We're so spoiled, so entitled. They still hold those house churches. Here we have the freedom. We can't fill up this room. Now that's a poor witness. That's a poor testimony. That tells something about us here as Christians in America. They risk their lives in a house church, underground house church, to not even, look, I got two Bibles here tonight, three, a commentary, you got your, your, your Bible and you got your iPad. 
they don't, sometimes they just have one sheet of paper and they pass that paper around. They'll make copies of it. And it, I, I'm trying to get our mindset here that we need to desire God's word <laughs> more than our necessary food, people. More, and I'm not against sports, but we need to desire the word of God more than sports. Yes. I mean, people, you know, they, they run to get to that, uh, the most of the game start, what, at 5 o'clock on Sundays? Oh, oh, oh so oh, nobody knows, huh? All right, that's good. No, <laughs> nothing wrong with that. But keep it in its proper perspective. Look at the scales. Are you giving more time to this thing than you're giving to God's way down here? Are you desiring God's word here as opposed to up here? At least give them equal time. But then we're going to talk about how, you know, later on how we're going to desire God's word and then we're going to elevate that. But just, you know, and please be in prayer for our brothers and sisters. You know, and in prayer I say God is not an American God. So, you know, we don't just play for people here in America. You need to be praying for even the radical Middle Easterners because they need Jesus. That's why they're doing what they're doing, because they need Jesus, the very person they rejected. So intercede, stand in the gap. Desire the word of God more than our necessary food. So that's my text. Hallelujah. All right. So he says this word commandment means that the law, ordinance, uh, precept. And so... I, the, the title of my message is Making God's Word a Priority. Making God's Word a Priority. That should be your purpose and my purpose above everything else that you and I are to make God's Word our priority. Let me give you a definition for a priority. Priority means precedence. It means especially established by order of importance or urgency. That's how we, the attitude that we have to have by the word of God. Based on an order of importance and urgency. We must have a priority of the word of God because there is an urgency that people are dying and going to hell and we're just sitting back blasé Oh, well, you know, you know, I got it all going on. We're blessed, highly favored, and we are. I wouldn't have it any other way. But we got to care about those that are lost. And that, I mean, when you, you know, when you see people on the street, you know, minister to them, minister, to, you know, don't, don't just look at that beggar on the street and just pass them by. I give to him, but I also give the word. That's an opportunity to share Jesus. Jesus says, whoever does this, a cold, give a cold water in my name. Hello. Making God's word a priority. Let's look at, first of all, what we're going to look at is how we're going to, this is how you're going to make God's word a priority. First of all, we're going to do it through the study of the word. This is what we're doing here tonight. But not only as you come here to Bible study once a week and church on Sunday once a week. We have to have this word of God before us every day. It's just not enough. We, I mean, you know, I went on this, um, this cleanse, right? So I kinda, it was kind of like a fast, right? So I was fasting from foods and stuff and, you know, lost some pounds. So that's what we need to go on a fast so that we can hear and, and get into God's word. Because the more that you get into God's word, the more that you're going to be able to hear accurately what's his plan and purpose for you. What does he want you to do in this situation? This is why we, many of us, including myself, have made decisions that brought some repercussions. Why? Because we didn't hear the voice of the God. Or we heard it, we ignored it. Because, what? number one, not spending time in prayer. And then getting into the word, he says, if you lack wisdom, 
How many of you made decisions you never thought about asking God about? <laughs> I'm actually saying that's, that's a rhetorical question. You don't have to raise your hand because I've done it. And it had some repercussions behind it. But, he, but that's why he says, if you, that's why you have to know what the word of God says. That's why the word of God has to be a priority. Because he says in James, if you lack wisdom, then you need to come ask me. You're not that smart that you can make this decision on your own. I mean, I know you think you are. None of us are that smart. So, he, so we have to study the word of God. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Making God's word a priority. That should be our number one priority, is to make the word of God our priority. And how are we going to do that? And we're looking at first, we're going to do it through the study of the word. Is, that's why you're here this evening. And many of you are so consistent, and we're going to believe that others will come into the sheepfold and be quite um, as well. What did I say, 2 Timothy 2.15? Okay, that is, oh, I'm in the wrong one. I'm in chapter 3. No wonder it looks strange. Okay, are we all there? Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. All right, so the scripture said study. Now, it's very interesting. This, this scripture did not say read. <laughs> That's different than just reading and studying. So he says study, and that word said is to make an effort. So in other words, you've got to put some forth some effort. You know, I have this one-year Bible, and I read it every day, you know, it takes it through, but I'm just doing straight reading. It doesn't take any effort to do that. I can read that in 15, 20 minutes. But it takes effort. Like when I was uh, reviewing for this class, it took effort to study, to dig and study. It says study to, to it means to labor. That's what the word study means. So he, God is serious. He says, study, labor in my word. Put some effort. Study to show thyself approved, acceptable unto God, a workman, a man that works. So that means there's some work involved here. See, the promises of God, yes, they are yes and amen, but they're not going to come by osmosis. They're not just coming by because you're a Christian. They're going to come by because you're doing, you're doing the word. You're working the word. We're working the word. That's how each one of us will be successful in life is when we apply the word of God. We have to work this word. I was listening to um, the radio on in, and, you know, they by asking, you know, a question this man was uh, have a blog or something and uh, it was interesting and you know it, it was talking about his blog says uh, being you know how the world says be true to yourself but his, his blog said be true being true being true to yourself is lying he said God never told us to be true to ourselves you know ourself we, what ourself was before we got born again we were sinners evil thinking evil thoughts proceeded forth out of our mouths and out of our hearts. So the world says, be true to yourself, but Jesus says, deny self. And because now you're going to deny, what he's talking about, deny that old self, because now you're a new self. You're a new self in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, he says, you are now a new species. Those old things, those old habits, those old ways, old way of thinking, old ways of doing things, they are passe. Study to show ourselves approved unto God so we don't have to be a workman that needed not to be ashamed. Because you need to have an answer when somebody asks you a question about Jesus about the word, about the Holy Spirit. You need to have an answer. Well, if you, how are you going to have that answer? You can't depend on a preacher all the time, a pastor. We've been called to the ministry of reconciliation, every believer. 
That's why he, th that is not to the pastor. That scripture is to the believers that we all have to study. There are people that God is going to bring in your life that you have to be ready for. So you, you minister effectively to them. And he's going to bring them. So keep coming, keep getting equipped, keep studying, and you're just going to see God move in people's lives, and you're going to get a reward for it. But you're doing it out of motivation of love, not to get something. It's always, all of our actions, everything that I do, all of my giving, my, what I do for people is motivated by love, no ulterior motive. And it should be the same way with everybody so he says here, in the latter part, he says, needed not to be ashamed, and because a lot of believers are ashamed because they don't know the word. That's the only reason they are ashamed. Rightly dividing, rightly dividing. Listen to that. Rightly dividing what? So if the writer says rightly dividing, what does that imply? That, that it can be a what? A wrong way to divide it. And I'm telling you, throughout the history of the church, there have been many wrong ways of dividing the word of God. I mean, people have come up with all sorts of things that God never intended. Because he only has one church. Uh, excuse me. He only has one church. You know, we say, well, this is the black church, this is the white church, this is the Filipino church, this is the Spanish church. Where did that garbage come from? He says one body, one faith, one baptism, that baptism will be emerged into the body of Christ. One church, one ecclesia that we've all been called out all over the world. And at Jesus' glorious appearing, guess what? All of us, all over the world, going to come together and worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. Oh, glory. Isn't that awesome? Hallelujah. That's awesome. Every tongue, every nation. Amen. Do you know that you can, you can go to another place and... Uh, you get to talking and you find out some, uh, that, you know, to another believer, those who have confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior. And there is a spiritual connection. You just get to talking as if you've known that person all of your life. Total stranger on an airplane or in another country. But there's a commonality there. Why? Jesus. 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 Everybody say Jesus. 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 Something about that name, isn't it? Just something about that name. Demons tremble. Yes. Yes. And those who are in Christ, we get excited about it like we are now. But then those who hate that name, gnashing their teeth and, you know, doing all kinds of things, you know, going against the believers and the word of God. We're talking about making God's word a priority. It is so important that we as believers make this word a priority over everything else. So we're looking through the study of the word. Go, turn with me to Acts chapter 17, the book of Acts chapter 17, making God's word number one. And that is my desire. That is my goal is to make his word number one. I'm not saying that you can't have a social life. That's not what I'm saying. But that God's word being a priority, it, it, it's, 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 what's that word? Skilter? Is that such a word? It's, give me, come on, help me out. What? Yeah. What? Yeah. A what? Yeah. Is that a legal term? <laughs> okay, a skelt? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, out of balance. Yeah. Oh, okay, got you. Oh, okay. So we want to get this thing in balance. Really, your goal is, you know, for, uh, you know, we'll give you your starting point. Let's have it balanced, God's word as opposed to everything else. But then let's raise it on up, raise that bar on up. 
Raise that bar higher and higher and higher and higher. And you're going to see how God, oh Lord, I, I can't, there's no words like it says in, in Corinthians. I, you, you, I have not seen nor heard what God will be doing in and through your life. So have you turned to Acts chapter 17? Yeah. Uh, we're going to look at verse 11. Actually, I'm going to start at verse 10 to bring in some continuity here. It says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither or there went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they what? They received the word with all what? Readiness of mind, and what did they do? That word search means to scrutinize. It means to investigate. It means to examine. It means to interrogate. It means to determine, discern, ask. And that word readiness of a willing mind. They had a willing mind. They didn't put up any stumbling blocks. They said they searched the scriptures daily, not once a week, people. Daily. I mean, we're so blessed to have this Bible because if you look at the history of the church, you know, the common man during the dark ages, they didn't have access to, to, to the scripture like we. We have so many Bibles here in America. We got all different translations. You know that, <laughs> do you know that the Bible is is the, it's the only book that's it's the highest selling still after all these years since King James 1611 had the book written and, and it's still the number one seller still the number one seller and, and you know we don't just have that one big Bible we used to have on the coffee table when I was growing up and nobody ever looked at it and read it just accumulated dust oh, we have four and five different translations But you got to get it off that coffee table. Because it ain't going to do you no good on the coffee table. How it's going to affect you is when you partake of it. Ingest it. Meditate on it. Eat on it. Desire his word more than your necessary food. I think I, I shared this before. Uh, we were at a, a women's retreat years ago in Marlon Gould. She said she would tell her, her body when she get up in the morning. She says she'll tell her body, no word, no food. What was she doing? She was, she was living according to that scripture, our foundational text, Job 20 through 12. She was saying, I desire God's word more than my breakfast this morning. That may be a good thing for us to do. And that way we'll partake of the word before we eat breakfast. Hello. Amen. Or before you have that first McDonald, not McDonald, uh, Starbucks, uh, tea, coffee, whatever. So you have to tell your flesh then, no word, no McDonald's, no Starbucks, or whatever your favorite place may be. So he, he said the Berean Christians, they search the scripture this is what God is talking to you and me this evening. So now you came here tonight. There's another scripture that says, to whom much is what? Given. Much is what? Given. Much is what? Required. So that means that we're going to be required of what he is telling us this evening. We say, Remember the Holy Spirit? He's the one that's teaching us this evening. John chapter 5. So don't even put involved, don't even put my name in there. It's the Holy Ghost that's teaching us and telling us what we need to do as believers. This is Jesus in, in 539, John chapter 5, verse 39. I think it's 39, yes. Are we there? The Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 39. So the Word of God says. Search, there's that word search again. Hmm. 
Now, Jesus is saying it now. Search, seek, investigate. Search the scriptures, the, the whole written word of God. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. What he's saying is the scripture is going to always what? Testify of him. It's going to always point you to Jesus. The scriptures will always point you to Jesus. The Holy Spirit will always point you to Jesus. If you're being pointed some other direction, what kind of spirit is that? Oh, somebody tell me. What kind of spirit? If it's not pointing to Jesus, what kind of spirit is it? Jesus called the what? Christ. The Christ. Thank you. He's, so it's, it's an anti, I'm not saying that he's anti-Christ, I'm saying the anti-Christ spirit though is here right now as we speak here all over the world. No, the anti-Christ has not been revealed because we're still here. But that spirit of anti-Christ is here. And so this is why Jesus is telling you, you search your scriptures. Because when you examine, scrutinize, interrogate, and such to search the scriptures, he says, they're going to testify of me. And they're not bear reckon testifying of him that he is God manifested in the flesh according to 1 Timothy 3.16. Antichrist spirit. They were talking about we, we, believers, you, you're too close. You're too close in looking like the world and you're thinking in, in your intellectualism. Renew this mind. You are distinctly different from the world in your actions and in your thought life. You can't begin to, 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 to be influenced by the culture. You better be influenced by this word. And you should be influenced by the culture, not they influencing you. But too many Christians don't want to take a stand because of peer pressure. Think about teenagers who have peer pressure. So do adults. They want to be one of the girls and one of the guys. Well, you can't be there if you're going to do this. <laughs> you're going to do what the scripture says. You cannot be one of the girls or one of the guys. Get over it. Because Jesus paid a heavy price for you and me. For us to even want to be one of the girls and one of the guys. He loves us so much. Gosh, he loved me when I wasn't even lovable. When I had such a bad attitude, didn't even consider him in my decisions, was, didn't have a prayer life. But guess what? He loved me because that's grace. <laughs> Thank God for grace. Amen. Thank God for grace. Thank God for mercy. We didn't have to do anything to earn this, this grace that he gave us. And because of the grace that he's given us, then we want to demonstrate our, that's why I love him. I love him more and more. You know how, why you, you, how you're going to get to love Jesus more and more? How do you love anybody more and more? What'd you say? Spend time, spend time with him. Well, he's not physically here, right? So then how do you want to spend time with him? Through the word. Be a lover of the word. Just like you love a spouse. You notice I didn't say a boyfriend, did you? A girlfriend. I said a spouse. And I'm talking about the, you know, the, 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 the God kind of love. See, there are four loves that the spouses get involved in. But for the rest of us, it's only three. That's agape. For us, it's agape, unconditional love, phileo love, brotherly love, and surrogate family. For the spouses, it's those three. And the fourth one is eros. And that's between a husband and a wife. Not a girlfriend or a boyfriend. And, 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 and yeah, and all, and all that other stuff. But see, that's going to come from you. If you don't know that, that's because you're not in the word of God. You have to get into the word of God to know that. And so that you can come because the world thinks you're crazy when you say stuff like that. But you're not crazy. You got the mind of Christ and you're right on. Amen. All right, let's go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. 
We're talking about making God's word a priority, and the, the first way we're going to do it is through the word of God, the study of the word. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Okay, getting there. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Huh? Five, six? We got it? Okay, somebody read because I don't have it yet. I can't even find it. Okay. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after what righteousness. And it's talking about a spiritual thirst. He says, when you thirst after righteousness, what it says, you shall be what? You're going to be filled. But you've got to have a hunger and a thirst for it. And just to pray the scripture, Father, See, what you do is how you pray, you pray the word. Father, I think you've given me such a hunger and a thirst for your word. And you need to learn Job 20 through 12. That's our Sobe Foundation scripture. I desire your word more than my necessity. Faith comes how? Hear you hear this over and over and over again? It's going to become a part of you. So he says, he is hung and thirst, I shall be filled. You remember the account with Jesus with the woman at the well? And, you know, and, and, and she, they had a dissertation about the well and Jacob's well and, and the water. And so Jesus basically was telling her, well, now, you know, if you partake of this water, you are going to thirst again. See, when you partake of the world's water, you're going to thirst. You're not going to be fulfilled. Right. Yeah, that's right. Oh, wow. And then Jesus told her, but the water that I'm giving you, it's water spring up to everlasting life. So the water, the word of God is also known as the water, the washing of the water with the word. And that's what the word of God does. It washes, it cleanses us. And so as we make God's word a priority, then we're going to have that desire. You're going to have to have the desire more than your necessary food. You're going to have to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Go to Psalm 42, verse 1, the 42nd division of Psalm. We're looking at the study of the word of God. Let's see, 42, 1. All right, okay. Psalm 42, verse 1. Are you almost there? Okay, I'm not there, so we all in the same, same page here. All right. So we should be there now, right? In Psalm 42, verse 1, it says, as the heart, in some translation it says deer, right? Okay. And I like to say deer because we don't usually use the word heart. As the heart a deer panted, that word panted means to long for it, to yearn eagerly. As the deer, the heart panted, yearns after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. When I looked this up, they said uh, the Kor Koroth wrote it, but they believed that David, it was David who was saying this because David was a man after God's own heart. And so he was saying as a deer, as he hunger, as he thirsts and, and, and strives for water, he says, so my soul. That's why this is what trips us up is the arena of the air, the soulish area. We were instantly, uh, our, our spirit man was instantly changed when we accept Jesus, Lord and Savior, but where we fall short is here. And so you got to have the same attitude that this, the psalmist was saying, that my soul, Father, longs after you. So if you're his, your soul is longing after him, that means you're hungering and thirsting after him, after his righteousness, after all the things that he's provided for you. You're searching after him. You're thirsting. You want to spend time in his presence. Because the Bible says in his presence there's what? Fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. See, the word happy, you know, people say, well, you know, I just want to be happy in life. Well, happiness can change because you're basing it on circumstances. You're basing it on things. You're basing it on an individual. But joy is one of your fruit of the spirit that you were given at the new birth. 
that Jesus deposited in us. He says, the joy of the Lord is our strength. So that's why we can always be joyous. Yeah, even in our darkest moment, you can be joyful. How? See, you're thinking naturally, if you say, asking me how. Because your joy is not predicated on what you're going through. Your joy is a person. And that you have a relationship with that person. And the only way that you can have a solid relationship with that person is to spend time with them. Husband and wife here. You have a solid relationship. Why do you have a solid relationship? Because you spend time with one another. Well, you got to spend time with Jesus. And the way that we do that is with the word of God. That's why when Paul was writing about the church, marriage, and Philippians, uh, Ephesians 5, he used marriage as an analogy to show how we're supposed to be in the church, the church with him. Having that fellowship, having that intimacy, loving him, loving him. I, I just want that, that to soak in, people. I just I wanted to soak in that this is how that we are going to show the world that we mean business. We don't, we don't need no religion. We don't need religious people. We need people who are actually in a relationship and spending time with him through study of the word so that salt can manifest, because salt is a preservative. It'll bring healing to, to people that you come in contact with. See, when we, spend time with, when we spend time with Christ, when we spend time in the Word, I'm expecting when I open my mouth, somebody gets healed. When I open my mouth, somebody gets delivered from something. I'm expecting that. What about you? You have to begin to expect it. That's why you are a, a, a carrier of the word. It's not about your needs being met. It's about meeting somebody else's need. Because when you meet somebody else's need, guess what? Yours is already met. But when you speak a word in season, that's what we pray. You should pray, be praying. Uh, Isaiah 50, verse 4. I thank you for waking me as a learned this morning so that I might have a word for him who's weary in season. There are a lot of weary people out there. So you have to decree, declare every morning, Father, you waken in me morning by morning. You waken in my ear, and I'm talking about my spiritual ear, to hear as a learned, so that I may have a word for him who's weary in season. Well, the only way I'm going to awaken as a learned each day is I got to get in here and know what the word of God says. How is I'm going to minister grace to the hearers? That's what Colossians says. That our word should be seasoned with salt so we know how to minister grace, God's ability in people's lives. Isaiah 50, verse 4. Now, I'm not telling you to turn. I'm telling you, you're going to meditate on that. <laughs> Away from here. We're going to de declare it and proclaim it. All right, we're still talking about, let's go to Joshua 1.8, one of my favorite scriptures. Joshua 1.8. We're still talking about how we can make God's word a priority through the study of the word. So let's go to Joshua Chapter 1, verse 8. The whole Bible really is my, uh, but I love Joshua. Are we there? Yes. I'm going to start at verse 6, and I want to uh, focus in on verse 8. He says, be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shall thou divide for inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only, verse 7, only be strong, thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law 
which Moses, my servant, commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Verse 8 is what I want to key in on. This book of the law, which is his word, shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate. And that word meditate means to murmur. It means to ponder. It means to speak. So when the Bible talks about meditation or to meditate, it's not talking about allowing your, man, your mind to go blank or to be put on some hypnotic spell where you can allow demons and everything else to get in there. No, when he says meditate, he's talking about thinking, muttering, speaking on his word. So don't be going, getting on no hypnotic trance. You don't know what you open your, yourself to. I don't know who's that for, but it's for somebody. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate. You're going to mutter. You're going to think, not go blank. You're going to think therein day and night. Not once a week. Not even twice a week. He says day and night, you need to mutter on this word because there's a reason for it. Meditate, mutter, think on this word there and day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shall make thou. It didn't say God was going to make your way prosper. Look what that said. For then thou. That's an old English word for you. And I'm going to say it for, uh, let me see. Yeah, let me do it over in, in Amplified. For then you shall make your way prosper. You will. But I don't know why I'm prospering. That's because you're not making your way prosperous. Because you're not doing what the scripture says. Could be. That maybe could be. He says you will make your way prosper. You're, not, you're waiting for God to make you prosper and he Telling you, you're going to make your way prosperous because you're going to do, you're not going to allow my word to not go forth out of your mouth. You're going to meditate on my word day in and day out. You're going to observe to do the law. You're going to observe to do the word. And when you observe to do the law, when you observe to do the word, he says, then you will make your way prosper. And then you shall deal. I love that's why I want to read from the Amplified. He says, you're going to make your way prosper. Listen to this, people. He said, you shall make your way prosper, and then you shall deal wisely and have good success. That's the Amplified Version. You will deal wisely. You're going to deal wisely in the affairs of life. You're not going to continue to make the same mistakes over and over again. Because doing the same thing over and over again, what does it say that creates? Insanity, inspecting the same results and doing the same thing over and over again. But he says that you and I, we're going to make our way possible and then we're going to deal wisely. And if you want to be successful, then you got to deal wisely. You got to deal wisely in, in raising your children, in relating to people, in your finances. The reason people are having challenges with finances and it's not necessarily because they don't make a lot of money, it's because not dealing wisely in their finances. Not being a good steward. Buying 300 pair of dollar shoes means you're paying your light bill. That's not dealing wisely. Going on a trip To somewhere and you don't pay your rent. Dog, people do that. That's not dealing wisely. One of the things that we say coming, come we say if you don't pay nothing else, you're being uh, uh, challenged with money, if you don't pay nothing else, you better pay your rent or your house note because you can always get some food somewhere. You can eat by candlelight. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But we have to learn, believers, believers have to learn to deal wisely in the things of life because we're being poor witnesses. See, we, we, you know, we think that, you know, we don't drink, we don't smoke, we don't gamble, we don't fornicate, we don't commit adultery. But how are we handling our finances? 
when we go to the bank. And then they get that check with the fish on or the Jesus sign, and then it bounces. You think that's a good witness? That's not dealing wisely. Why? Because we're not keeping the accurate records. You know, with all the ATM, you know, you go withdraw off ATM, but you don't record it. Uh, you know, what you do to receipt, just put it in your purse or your pocket and never look at it, and then you never uh, record it in your checkbook. So then you're overdrawn, and you have to end up paying what? The bank $35. Is that dealing wisely? That's not dealing wisely. But see, when you meditate on God's word, he's going to show you how to deal wisely in the things of life. And so these are just practical things that we must do as believers. We need to bone up in two areas, finances and marriages. I mean, and that's my observation. Finances, marriages. We got to get better in marriages. Our marriages, not what it should be. Too many divorces. And that's because folks are not doing this. Yeah, this, this, this hasn't been a priority. Everything else has been a priority in their lives but the word of God. When you both, when both a husband and wife make application, and then don't preach at one another, but you just do your part. Uh, you know, too often, you know, everybody want to point their finger. No, change always began with me. I can't look at you. If I look at a, uh, having a challenge with a relationship situation, I need to look at me, okay, how can I, how could I have done this differently? See, we have to come and always look back at how we should, could it be because see, we're supposed to be what? Other-centered, right? Remember that I taught on relationships some time ago? I guess not. Yeah. <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You need to get the tape then because, yeah, I mean, we deal with relationships day in and day out. So Joshua 1.8, he talks about we're going to make our way prosper as we get into and meditate on God's word. Go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Is that three minutes? <laughs> Are you kidding? No, praise the Lord. Matthew 6, 33. This will be our last scripture then. Hallelujah. Who, who has it? Read it, because I'm, I, my time. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Oh, Lord. I, you know, I'm just believing that believers will get this. What is the, what's the beginning of the verse they do? Seek what? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. So seek his kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. And the Amplifier says, but seek aim at and strive after first of all, not second, first of all, his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right, doing his, his things his way. He says, then all these things will be added unto you. But what most Christians do is they seek things first and then seek him. And he's telling us to seek his kingdom. He has to be number one. He, he don't want no part-time love. That may have worked for Johnny Taylor years ago, but it ain't going to work for God. He wants your full time. He wants you to love him with all your heart and all your soul. He wants you to spend time in his word. He wants you to desire his word more than your necessary food. He wants the word of God to be a priority in your life. He wants us to study the word of God so that we can make him number one. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Every head bow, every eye closed. Father, we just thank you for the delivery of your word. We thank you. Salvation is the free gift that the Lord offers anyone who would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans 10:9 and 10 that with our hearts we believe unto righteousness and with our mouth confession is made unto salvation. I trust that you will believe God's word, that your faith will be in the risen Savior who came to give his life for you. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Will you pray with me this prayer of salvation? It's not difficult. It's very easy, but you must mean it from your heart. So repeat these words after me. Jesus, I confess you as my Savior and my Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. With my mouth, I confess you and I receive you as my Savior. Jesus, thank you for making my heart your home. Thank you for living in me. God the Father is now my Father and the Holy Spirit has done a work in me. I am a new creature in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving me and thank you for guiding my life. In Jesus' name, amen. We're here to be a blessing to you at Spirit Food Christian Center. The way this broadcast is brought to you is by people's faithful sowing and reaping as a result of God's word being given unto them. So I want to encourage you, be a part of this ministry of sowing and reaping. The Bible says, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. In this ministry, we believe that man must hear the word of God. For man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The Bible declares, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. God loves a cheerful and hilarious giver. I encourage you, be a part of this ministry. Be hilarious in your giving and watch the Lord bring it back to you in many, many ways. In Jesus' name. You have been watching the Spirit Food Christian Center worldwide webcast online at www myspiritfood.com Join us for worship service each Sunday at 9.30am and be sure to check out our website for our weekly live broadcast and much, much more. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good.